Good morning, First Congregational. Good morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Just to worship God and experience God in a whole nother way. As I reflect upon this week, I thought about in the midst of elections and things that seem to not play so well the way I would think it should, but uh, the race in Florida also reminded me that if you hold on just a little while longer, God has a way of shifting some things and maneuvering some things just so you can see who God really is. And so with that, let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious God, we're grateful that you are a God who is still about change, a God who is still speaking, a God who is still able to move and breathe and continuously commune with your creation to see anew. So God, continue to cultivate within us a, a moral center that is bounded in love, not of hate, not of prejudice, not of bigotry, but one who is bounded to seeing a beloved kingdom here on earth. God, we're grateful to give you all the glory, honor, and the praise, for we acknowledge your spirit in this place. It's in your son Jesus' name we do pray, and the people of God said, amen. amen. For all those who are physically able, if you would please stand with us as we sing our opening hymn found in the red hymnal, our UCC hymnal number 198, God of grace and God of glory.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Please remain standing for the reading of the litany on page three. O oh God, we desire to be good stewards of all that you have made, the earth, the world, and all that dwells therein. All that we have, have comes as trust from you. We are called by God to use whatever gifts we have been given in service to others. As you have so freely given to us and lovingly made us what we are, we now freely give back to you the substance of our lives, our time, our talents, and money. We are reminded in the gospel from the poverty of the cross, we have gained the richness of life. You have put your divine stamp upon us, endowed us with honor, and created us in your likeness. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Through providence and grace, we offer our tithes and offerings on your altar. Our health and strength have come from you, and it is you who make our financial resources possible. Teach us to give as we have received. Remind us that what we claim as ours is really yours. Without your gifts to us, we have nothing. We have received the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ as a gift, and we have been made his disciples. We pray that we shall be good and faithful stewards, sharing with others the light that Jesus Christ has given us. After giving and serving from a willing heart, we have received. Now let us freely give. Amen.
We invite you now to prepare yourselves for the power of prayer. In our tradition, we, some of us, will come and stand in this chancel or kneel in this chancel as we pray together because we know that when we pray together as the people of God, this is one of the most powerful aspects of our worship. This has been an extraordinary week in our city, our state, in our country, and our world. There's a lot to pray about. There's some things we don't even know that we need to pray about, that we need to pray about. And I want to call a few things to your attention in hopes that you would lift up some of our prayer concerns that need to be shared. First of all, I want to ask all of you to continue to pray for Earl Minchhofer. He's been recovering from heart surgery, and he and Pam are on the other side of the surgery, but they need your prayers. They need your thoughts. They need just a card. I want you to pray for Reverend B, Barbara Gandhi, Nadine's partner. She's been having some really difficult health challenges and is in the hospital. We need to pray for her, and she needs to feel your prayers this very day. Jane Wallace let me know that some of her relatives in Paradise, California, have been affected by the fire. She showed me the pictures of her family who they've lost their homes. And so this is not some distant fire that doesn't affect us. It affects us directly and immediately. Pray for Jane and for her family, for her extended family, and all of those who've been ravaged by fire. California has had such a traumatic week, the shootings in Pepperdine. Pray for those families of those students who send their kids to school not expecting that they would not come home. Beloved, we need to pray about guns and violence. I know we keep saying it, but I heard that mother say, don't pray anymore, give me gun control. She doesn't want she doesn't want a prayer that's not connected to an action. And I don't know how many more times. My fear is that we become numb. Pray. Pray for Reverend Laverne, whose sister is in transition even now in hospice. She just needs to feel your, your prayers and lift her up in, in prayer. And beloved, then pray for yourself because God wants to hear from you and God will speak directly to you. Let us pray. Most merciful and ever-loving God, one hardly knows where to begin. For our military veterans who have served their country so courageously and sometimes come home only to be forgotten and certainly not to be supported. For our children now who spend as much time learning how to shelter in place as they do learning a new lesson in school. For those who are now learning how to live in fear all the time, Lord, we, we turn to you because we don't know who else we can turn to. Hear our prayers for those that are grieving, for those, Lord, who have suffered losses, not just of family, but of all things, and have to rebuild again. Remind them, Lord, and us that through you all things are possible. For those of us, Lord, who have gotten a difficult diagnosis from the doctors, remind us once again that you are the divine physician who can heal all things, 
fix all maladies, see all things. You have not only the diagnosis, but Lord, you've got the divine prescription that can do the healing that needs to be done. For our young people, Lord, who are trying to find their way through this world that gets increasingly difficult, Help them, Lord, and help us to help them. Lord, let this be a time of reconnecting not only to you, but also to each other. Because we know that we are stronger together than we are apart. And Lord, we know that the devil is always busy. We're not so sophisticated that we don't know that evil is real. Evil is tenacious. Evil is even patient. Like the devil said to Jesus, he, he left him for a while, but he said he was going to come back at another opportune time. Seems like there's a lot of opportune times coming right about now. But Lord, help us to be ever vigilant and ever trusting in your will and the good in us because you placed it in us. Lord, for those of us that voted and want to make sure our votes are counted, let us not get discouraged or turn back, but remember that this is all part of the process. Help us to just trust in doing what we're supposed to do, and you'll take care of the rest. And most importantly, Lord, when we come to worship, we come to get our spirits right. So get our spirits right that we can deal with a world that's all wrong. Help us now to feel emboldened, empowered, enabled to go where you send us and to go with the trust that you can change and fix all things that are broken. Keep us mindful, Lord, of Jesus the Christ who lived and died and was resurrected for us and our, for our sakes. And help us to always remember the prayer he taught his disciples in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The New Testament reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 38. Through 44. 
As he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with the respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows, houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, had put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The word of God for the people of God. to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord which made heaven and earth. He said, he will not suffer thy foot, thy foot to be moved. The Lord that keepeth thee, he will not slumber nor sleep. Oh, the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand, upon thy shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. He shall preserve thy soul even forevermore. My
Amen. My help comes from the Lord, but from the Lord. Amen. No better song to begin this moment in our worship service. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Julian. Julian has a nice, nice touch on that piano, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. Beloved, before I begin my short message, and I'll only be preaching a couple of hours today, um, I want to uh, remind the women of the Altar Guild that there will be a meeting in the Herndon Tower immediately after this service. So the Herndon Tower is right up there. Uh, women of the Altar Guild, please come to that meeting. Beloved, today I want to speak to you briefly on the subject of the might of a might. The might of a might. You know I love a good title. I spend as much time on my title as I do on the sermon. Uh, the might of a might. You heard the scripture as it was read. It is the scripture of the widow's might. The widow's might. The might is a small coin. Scripture tells us that it was worth less than a penny. And it was the widow's might that Jesus took great pleasure with as he was trying to teach his disciples something about stewardship. And as I looked at the lectionary and as I thought about that might, I thought that that might of a might is that that little coin in the master's hands becomes a powerful something. And so Jesus uses this as a teaching moment to the disciples. He had just criticized the scribes and the Pharisees because they were wearing long robes and praying in public to make sure that people heard them praying lengthy prayers. They were putting in the money into the, into the plate and making sure that everyone saw them putting their money in the plate. And he was trying to warn his disciples and his teaching, and I think warn all of us, that let us not get wrapped up in the show of it, but rather the stewardship of it. This is a stewardship message, and 
This is supposed to be Stewardship Sunday, but beloved, I believe that every Sunday is Stewardship Sunday. Every Sunday, first Sunday, second Sunday, every Sunday that you, every Monday is a Stewardship Monday. Because when you live for God, you give God whatever it is you have. But when you place it in God's hands, something powerful happens. The might of a might. I'm preaching that because I was taken about how intentional Jesus was with the disciples. It wasn't that he was criticizing the wealth of the wealthy. He was just saying that they give. It's not even important. They're just giving their extra. They don't even think about it. But here is this woman who gave all that she had to live on. That's what scripture says. She gave everything and put it into the plate. That's a mighty gesture. The might of a might. I want to talk about philanthropy, but not with all those big idealists. I want to break it down to the widow's might. Because you know, widows are highlighted a lot in scripture. It's, it's not accidental that, that this, this character in our drama here is a widow. Because in scripture, and it's all through scripture, in the Psalms and in Deuteronomy, it speaks of the ways in which the widow is oftentimes the most forgotten in the community. That's why the Lord encourages the nation of Israel to take care of your widows. Because they knew that the widows would be the ones that have the least are taken care of the least and the first forgotten. So they built it into the, to the fabric of the faith community that you would take care of the widows and the orphans and the least of these. And here this widow, the, the least of these, with the least to offer, gives all that she has. What a powerful message. The might of her might. That is what you would call a homonym. You didn't know that, did you? It, 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 I went and looked it up. What about those words that sound alike but have a different spelling? And then there are words that sound alike but have the same spelling but have different meanings. And beloved, today we got a double. We got a twofer. Because first of all, a mite is really a, a homonym, right? It, it's, it's spelled the same way but it has two different meanings. A mite is a small coin. But it's also a little bug, right? That's a, that's a hominid. But a homophone, a homophone, it, it, it has two different spellings, two different meanings, but it sounds alike. You get it? Homophone, same sound. The might of a might. Ooh, I got a sermon title here. Lord have mercy. I'm getting ready to let the choir just start singing. But the, the, the might of a might. Why is this important? Because I think that sometimes we underestimate our might. We, we, we're lamenting what we don't have. As opposed to celebrating what we do have. But not only that, using what we do have for God's purposes. It, it's kind of pitiful to see just how wealthy this community is, we as a people of God, and how we go around thinking that we don't have anything to do anything with. To me, that is a tragedy, a, a travesty. And when I think about the widows who gave so that the next generation might have, they understood the power of the little. The power of the, of the might. I, I was just at my alma mater the other week, and we were celebrating what we call the Mary Goodman Circle. You've never heard of Mary Goodman. Mary Goodman was a laundress. She was a former slave who had ended up living in New Haven, Connecticut. And she was a laundress. She didn't have any education. She didn't have any family. But she gave all that she had in her will to the Yale Divinity School so that black men and women could attend the Divinity School with her gift. It was the first gift. I didn't even know about this. It was the first gift that a black person had ever given Yale in 1872. 
When she died, she gave all that she had, and she had a lot. She had $5,000. And she left it all to Yale, that blacks might get educated at Yale. This woman who I'm certain was counted out as not being important and not being wealthy, she gave what she had that it might go to the good. She didn't even save enough money to be buried. The school had to bury her, but don't you know they buried her in the prestigious Grove Cemetery? In the Yale section. Because she was a laundress who gave all that she had that somebody might be educated. And the first two black graduates of the Yale Divinity School graduated because of her gift. That gift that she gave of $5,000 in 1872 is now over 200,000. We created a circle so that now the people that have money can contribute to the, her idea. And now it's over a million dollars. Come on. 5,000 becomes a million. Because she put that little bit, she put that might of hers into something mighty. To me, that's powerful. We don't know her, but we know her work because she's been supporting people just like we must support our people. They won't necessarily know our names. They won't necessarily have us inscribed on something, but when we're doing good work, the good work speaks for itself. Amen. That's the stewardship. The stewardship is, you know, I don't have a whole lot, but I'm not going to sit and look at what I have. I'm going to give it to that, it, that it can go to something good. That's where my power is. My power, my friends, is in my vote. How sad it is that the demographic that didn't move the needle at all were young people, 18 to 25. They didn't go to the polls still. How many more young people have to be killed before they get the message that they need to participate with the little might that they have? We might be in a different situation than we are right now. I'm astounded that more people get killed. There have been, I think, mass shootings once a week for the entire year. You name the place. We were just in the synagogue last week. Pittsburgh, South Carolina, North Carolina, California, Las Vegas. When does it end? It ends when we start using our might. It ends when we start using our voice. It, ends, it begins when we, when we start using our institutions for the good. I'm glad the brothers of Q-Side Fire are here today because there's a lot of power in these brothers. There's a lot of brothers who are in the Alpha Phi Alpha Incorporated. Just to drop a name. Oh, six. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but... But brothers, we have power that we're not using. That's why I'm saying that. I'm saying that I think we need to look at ourselves as opposed to lamenting the insanity in Washington. I think we need to look to the power that we have in ourselves. We need to look at the might in our might. We need to look at our voices and stop complaining and start doing something. It's interesting that Jesus uses that example of the Pharisees and the scribes as a word of caution to the disciples. Because don't you know the scribes and the Pharisees, they like to hang out with the rich people and so that they can get nice robes and nice situations. And Jesus was cautioning to say that if you're going to be my disciple, you have to reject all of that stuff. And then serve me and follow me. And then I just saw them this morning when I was putting the finishing touches on my sermon, there was a brother on the television saying, if you just send fifty-eight ninety-five, uh, you're going to get a blessing and prosperity like you never dreamed before. And I got so mad, I almost, almost hit the television. Why? Because a lot of people say, well, let me write my check. He wouldn't be doing that except it's so doggone profitable that there have been people like selling that, that charade for a very long time. You remember Reverend Ike? Yes. Reverend Ike said the best way to help poor people is to not be one. <laughs> Come on now. That's not what Jesus said. That's what I, Reverend Ike said. 
And somehow, I think we missed the message. The message was, use what you have to God's glory. Use what you have. And so I think that all of the bad stuff that we're experiencing right now is really your wake-up call. It is our time to continue to stay woke, as they say. But to understand that staying woke is not a moment. you got to always stay woke. You can't think about, oh, well, we lost the election. She didn't make it. No, beloved, that's looking at it the wrong way. Let me tell you the way to look at this election. The way to look at this election from my perspective is that Stacey Abrams almost and may well still defeat Brian Kemp. So for those of you that are not from Georgia, let me tell you what that means. It would have been unthinkable, unimaginable that a black sister with brains could, could become a candidate for governor, let alone get that close. The reason why we celebrate is because that's incremental, because guess what? The times, they are a-changing. And if she didn't get there this time, guess what? You're going to see her again. Guess what? That, that young brother from Florida, that young brother who is so articulate, and so well uh, presented and so, so elegant in his presentation and refuses to get down in the gutter, you're going to see him again. He's young. He's on his way. And if we do what we're supposed to do, we're going to ensure the progress that is never permanent. It's never permanent. That's why voter suppression, no one should be surprised. They've been doing this since we got the vote. The jelly bean contest. How many jelly beans? Y'all look surprised. How many jelly beans, boy, is in this jar? And if you couldn't guess the right number, which of course you could not, you could not vote. It's sobering, beloved, but we should not be surprised that evil is alive and well in the world. We don't cower from it, we go to it. We go to it with what? With our might. With the might of our might, we go, we go to where the call is. And guess what? That's how things change. Step by step. They killed Jesus on a cross. He had done a lot of good. The disciples got discouraged. What do we do now? What we do now is to do what Jesus said. Love the Lord with all your heart and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all you got to do is do what he says. He will take care of the rest. That's the good news. So don't be depressed today. Get energized today because we're not done yet. That's what I got excited about last week, that we're not done yet. We're, we're getting ready for the next moment. And just one aside, because there was a moment of humor last week, so... All of my friends who were clergy came in this worship service, you recall, and they prayed over me at the end. It was powerful, brothers of, of QSI 5, that we had the kneeling bench, and all of these clergy from all over the country came and laid hands on me, like Peter laid hands on those who were his, his disciples. And it was powerful, but, but let me tell you what was funny about it. So you recall Jim Forbes, the great preacher, who was 85 years old, he preached up a storm. And as he preached, he started to describe being the potter and the potter's wheel. And he, he's so agile. He's 85. And he started to go all down and get all low. All that kind of stuff. It was amazing. He was so smooth and so agile, right? So when I got ready to, to get on that, that kneeling bench to pray... And my brothers and sisters, all these preachers, started to give these long blessings. And my knees started to hurt. <laughs> and so my prayer became, Lord, help me to get up. <laughs> and don't you know it took about four or five of those preachers to help me get up that bench. But I was grateful because they helped me to get up. The Lord gives you what, what you need, right? 
So these bad knees, I, I, I had a little help from my friends. And the reminder is, is that God keeps blessing us in different ways. So I may not be able to move like Reverend Forbes, but as long as God gives me breath in my body, oh, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to use the might of my might. I encourage you all to do the same. God bless you. Amen. The invitation is to come, to come to Christ. Beloved, we open the doors of the church and we say to any of you who are looking for a church home, a community of faith, a place where you can live out your faith and be supported by others who are not perfect, but we're being perfected by God and God's grace. Come and be a part of this community of faith. It's a, it's a wonderful community. And if not this community, find a place where you can feel welcome and can grow and be challenged and participate. I'm going to invite all of you now to stand as the choir sings us into this moment. And if this is your day to join us in fellowship, come down and stand with me and I will take you into membership right now.
Amen. I want to thank the choir for its wonderful leadership under the, the direction of Sheila Wheat. Let's say amen. Our organist and chancel choir director, Trey Clegg, and now Julia Reed, who has become a part of this family. I like that part. Come ye who weary and heavy laden. Oh my goodness. Amen. God is good. Beloved, as we prepare now for the benediction, we want to wish all of you a safe and peaceful week. There is much work for us to do. We know that. But we will do God's work with joy, always with joy, because it's a blessing to be able to work for the Lord. I want to thank all of you, and I want to ask all of you for your prayers. I go to Washington tomorrow for the funeral of my friend Zaki, and to Zaki Shange's funeral will be tomorrow. And it's a great loss for our community, but we're going to have a celebration of life for this wonderful, wonderful spirit. We're going to invite our acolyte to take the light back out into the world, our service of silence, and then the benediction. Let us now receive the benediction. Let us pray. Most merciful God, Lord, we thank you for this time together, for this fellowship, for this family of faith. We thank you for each person and family represented here. And Lord, we're grateful for this time to be fortified and to be enriched by your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that as we go back out into the world that you might use us, that you would guide our feet and order our steps and help us to be a blessing to someone else. Lord, we're grateful for every moment that we have on this earth, and we ask you to help us to use ourselves wisely, to be good stewards of the gift that is not our own, but that you've given us our lives, our very lives. This has been a wonderful day, Lord. We ask that you give us many, many more that we can be the people you've called us to be. And now unto him who is able to present you before his throne with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God be glory, honor, dominion, and majesty now and forevermore. Let this entire congregation say, Amen. Amen. Amen.